um, it's not for me to speak at you for uh, more than about 10 minutes. It's for us to have uh, engage in a discussion with each other so we can begin to understand when we're making these claims, what type of a statement are we making. We're all familiar with the canonical principles uh, of bioethics. Uh, we have to respect patient autonomy. Uh, we try to do things in the best interest of our patients. We try to avoid harm at all costs. We try to strive for justice. Each one of these principles comes into conflict sometimes in the very same case. If you've been watching the Supreme Court decision that came out last week, I think uh, that, that one case challenges all of these principles. Um, and, and so conflict continues to ensue despite agreement on what these principles are. Now the literature would suggest that when we have conflict at end of life, uh, it, at least in the last 10 to 15 years, the, the vast majority of the literature says the solution, what we need to work on is better communication. We all need to be better communicators. And despite that, uh, and I think a lot of effort has gone into uh, how do we improve communication, our ethical obligation towards process often gets overlooked. And the process uh, is the consent process. And it's, it's very straightforward. It's very basic, but it's almost so basic that uh, we forget to, uh, to, to adhere to it at times. So over the course of a few years of research, we've actually found in Ontario that a whole bunch of cases that get contested at end of life that go to the consent and capacity board, for example, or go to the courts are the result of some sort of consent-related error. Uh, where we make an error in the consent process at some step along the way and then we've actually termed this ethical error because otherwise we wouldn't uh, be able to recognize it. Uh, so ethical error refers to any element of the informed consent process being done inappropriately. Inappropriate may refer to uh, expectations uh, of consent related elements, so the test for capacity where no such uh, element is required. So sometimes we say, for example, uh, you're not capable to go home to and we say this to elderly patients all the time, you're not capable to go home. You're going to go home and you're going to be unsafe. Uh, there's no such thing as a test for capacity to go home. If you are done, you're, you know, if you're a subacute patient and you want to go home, it doesn't matter if you give consent or not. You don't have to be capable, you get to go home. Um, but it, it may also refer to a misinterpretation of consent relating uh, to an element. So how we interpret patient values, uh, and this is kind of more often what happens at end of life, it may be that we're speaking to the wrong substitute decision maker. And this is uh, something that uh, has happened very recently uh, in ICU even. Um, we need to know that we're talking to the right person, first of all. We need to know that the patient has actually been documented as being incapable, even when it's very obvious. And this checklist here on the right, I, I, uh, will, I mean, you have availability to the slides, and you can get those afterwards. Um, the checklist is very straightforward. But the importance of it actually was just highlighted yesterday. So following this Supreme Court case uh, from last week that was just, uh, just released, uh, a lawyer, Daphne Jarvis from uh, BLG, uh, was giving a summary to uh, the OHA about what the implications were for medical practice. And she really, at the end of her presentation, summarized, here are the takeaway points that we need to be uh, thinking about in all of our end-of-life cases. And all she really did was actually go over our checklist. Um, the, the checklist is, is very straightforward, uh, and I just wanted to take the time to kind of uh, plug this a little bit this morning, because it helps us understand the distinction between, well, we have obligation towards our patients at, at end of life, but what happens when our patients cross the boundary and they're now deceased patients? How do our obligations change? Um, one of the things we often say about uh, how, you know, when we, when we look for means of improving the system, uh, reducing costs and improving quality in the system. We often point to inappropriate treatment uh, and, and futility and rationing are the, the kind of the two big, uh, what I actually think are, are red herrings uh, to an extent. Um, but this is, if you think about it really, the, the tip of the iceberg. These cases actually comprise uh, much less of uh, the problem than we think. Below the iceberg I think is the uh, inappropriate consent for treatment that occurs much more frequently. This is our looking at quality improvement processes. Um, this is our day-to-day -day, uh, you know, consent-related errors that are happening in hospital uh, uh, all over the place. So that's just speaking about our ethical obligations to patients while they're alive but going through the dying process. Um, one of the last obligations we have to talk about is discussion with patients while they're alive about organ donation. So is there an ethical obligation to discuss organ donation with our dying patients? Uh, does that present a conflict of interest. At what point in time do you begin that conversation with the patient who uh, we anticipate will be dying? More often than not that we're having the conversation with families, but should we, if we're going to uh, respect patient autonomy and ensure that a patient is able to provide an informed decision for themselves, 
be having more of this conversation with the patients themselves. But just a, a question to be thinking about. All of this is leading up to where we're going to uh, go in just a few minutes. So uh, our ethical obligations before and after death for a dying patient who, who's uh, still with us, a patient's best interests are supposed to be our preeminent obligation. Uh, only after that come the family interests. Now, I think many of you would, would say that there are cases where those two things get conflicted. Um, it, that is true. That happens all the time. But this is the, the order I think that professionally we would agree that this is the order of, of things. And only societal interests the interest of uh, resource allocation that often comes up, that actually comes last when it's the clinician at the bedside treating the patient. So the clinician at the bedside cannot say, for the sake of saving uh, resources for, for all of society, I have to you know, disregard my patient's best interest. So that makes sense for the, for the dying patient. For the dead patient, though, things change quite a bit. Uh, societal benefits in terms of organ donation becomes the preeminent value. Uh, family's interests actually sub subjugated below that, uh, legally speaking, but we all know that if a family objects to a donation where a, a patient has actually indicated on, uh, on, is registered online that they would want to be a donor and a family objects, well perhaps these two things get conflicted. We can talk about whether that's appropriate or not. Um, but the patient's interests actually come last. Once they're dead, what interests do they have? And, and does it even make sense to talk about them as a patient? Does that, does that language confuse what our obligations are to them? You're going to see in a few minutes when we talk about the cases how this is going to become very uh, apparent. But in between, there's, this, there's a, a huge uncertainty. So you might say, well, wait a second. What's in between dying and dead? Uh, well, we have uh, at least one case where there's uncertainty. And when there's uncertainty regarding is my patient dead, well, where do my obligations lie? Is it to societal benefit so that we can harvest organs, or is it towards the patient where we say we can only do things that are going to benefit the patient? And that's going to present us with some challenges. Thinking about the broad ethical issues around uh, deceased organ donation, the, the kind of, I think it's important to uh, highlight these big policy issues. Uh, whose choice is it? When do we pro procure organs? And, and whose resources are they? But what we're going to talk about today are the more practical frontline issues. The can we treat a patient as a means to another's ends? Uh, what is our responsibility towards dead persons, and what if we can't declare vain death? On the legal side, uh, whenever we talk about ethics, we often start by talking about what is the law. For our purposes, the types of ethical dilemmas we're going to describe, the law provides us no, no easy answer. So the law is there to serve uh, the process function, but we're still going to result to a whole bunch of unanswered ethical questions. The big policy issues, really quickly, uh, whose choice? Uh, certainly, if we're going to respect patient autonomy, we think that patients should be able to opt in. Uh, and most Western countries have an opt-in policy where you have to register to be an organ donor. Uh, but there are some who have challenged that and said, well, once you're dead, patient autonomy doesn't mean anything. You're dead. You don't have those interests anymore. And therefore, it should be more of an opt-out policy. And we do have some examples of that uh, in different parts of the world. Regarding opt-in policies, you can even take it a step further and say, well, who gets to decide? Should it only be the patient? As in Japan, the patient has to expressly provide their consent. Or if a patient has not said anything about organ donation, is it appropriate for a surrogate to say, yes, I think my loved one would have wanted to have donated? And if so, does it even does, you know, take it a step further? Does it matter how a surrogate comes to that decision? For living patients, the way that surrogates make decisions is really important. Uh, what, when we, if I were to refer back to the checklist, one of the things we have to do in the checklist is ensure that substitute decision makers understand what the rules for decision making are. But there are no prescribed rules for decision making once a patient is dead. Uh, the big policy issue too, when do we procure organs? So the, the overarching uh, ethical principle here is the dead donor rule. We cannot take organs from somebody if, the, if that is the act that is going to uh, cause their death. So that they need to be dead. But of course, over uh, the last 30 or 40 years, we've had to modify our definition of death to serve uh, the interests of the many. <clears throat> so, you know, in the 70s, we had the, the brain death criterion that was uh, w well articulated by uh, the, a group at Harvard. Uh, but uh, obviously, when organs started not being, when, you know, when for some reason we saw not enough organs uh, for the demand, uh, we needed to revisit the DCD criterion. But there's all sorts of ethical questions about, well, okay, well, even with DCD, when is dead dead? And even in Ontario, we have hospitals that have different policies around this. If, if you're uh, at St. Mike's, you might be 
alive, whereas in London you might be considered dead for a few minutes difference. But those few minutes might be actually, ethically speaking, very important. And then there are uh, interesting policies like, uh, like in Japan where the patient actually gets the choice of cardiac or brain death uh, criteria. The last big policy issue is whose resources are they? Uh, is it a societal need where the resources belong to everyone, to the, to the greatest need? Or is it in, an individual property issue? Uh, uh, how far do we take uh, ownership of the body? Can an individual direct where their organs go when they're deceased, either for profit or, as I've even heard in the last year, we had a scenario, and, and maybe this will ring bells for some of you, uh, where a patient uh, who wanted to be a donor recognized that they had a family member who was actually in need of an organ and wanted to direct a deceased uh, organ uh, to a family member. Now, ethically, should that be appropriate? Legally, we know uh, the system is not set up for that. So the case discussions um, are we, what we're going to get to right now. Um, that's just the, the, the quick background. But uh, we really need participation in this conversation. And, uh, and so for that, we're going to turn this over to Mike, who's uh, much more accustomed to agitating uh, a group. Uh, if I can remind the speakers, if you have any questions from the audience, we'll repeat the questions for the people online. Um, okay, the first one I think is, we, we tried to start off quite as simple as possible, but even going through each of these cases, um, we have questions about uh, every aspect of the case, including the consent process and so on. But this is something we see very regularly. It's a 65-year-old gentleman who had a very large intrastural hemorrhage in a community hospital. His Glasgow coma scale was three, and therefore needed airway protection, intubated for the process of determination of uh, etiology, had a CT scan. Pupils were already fixed and dilated. Uh, however, a cough was still present. Neurosurgery assessed the CT scan online, and um, they said this is a terminal bleed. They will not survive with no surgical options. The family wished organ donation. Um, I'm going to simplify this case even more. This patient was um, uh, registered as a donor. And the patient also discussed with his family that if anything happens to me, I want to be an organ donor. So that's fairly straightforward. I think we have expressed wishes of the patient. I want to be an organ donor. As I said, the patient was intubated for protection of airway <coughs> and transferred to the intensive care unit. Um, what is this called? This patient is now on a ventilator, going to die. The only reason in the ICU is for the purposes of organ donation. Pro pro progression to expectation, progression to neurological determination of death and organ donation. Limbo. It's, non it's a term called non-therapeutic mechanical ventilation. Is this standard of care? We do it all the time. Is it standard of care? Yes. Okay. Rob, do you want to make some comments about this? <laughs> this is an issue. Um, and uh, clearly, a much stronger issue of people are compelled to say, this is wrong. We should not be intubating these patients. And um, um, these patients should be left, left to die. So if we take a step back, um, in 1990s uh, in the UK, the Exeter Protocol was developed where they were doing precisely this. And for a few years, they were chugging along. And uh, eventually, somebody said, well, wait a second. This is perhaps not legal to uh, provide treatment to a patient that is not for that patient. It is not in that patient's interest. Remember that uh, slide where I said, what are our ethical obligations to a dying or living patient? And it's the patient's best interests first. So if this is the standard of care, how is it that what we're doing here can be seen as being for the patient's best interest? Which, which patient? And, and precisely, that's a fantastic question. For the ICU physician, it's the patient in the bed in front of them. Um, Absolutely. So that, that's the distinction between our obligations to society and our obligations to our patients in front of us. And to avoid conflict of interest, we try not to have an individual making decisions about both. 
That's why we say at the bedside, uh, I, I don't let Mike withdraw life support from somebody to make space for a future patient just because he disagrees with, with that life support, right? So it's your obligation is to that patient in the bed in front of you. Society needs to develop systems for addressing the societal need. That's where the challenge comes in. Oh, yes. Okay, so, yes, yeah, so, so on, for those online, uh, oh, you want to summarize? Yeah, you're right, Ravi. This is the sequence of events. Patients get intubated. They have a decreased level of consciousness. We don't have an etiology. They go to the CT scan. They've got a terminal bleed. What do you do next? Absolutely, and, and though those four principles, the four canonical principles, have never meant to be ordinal principles. So that it's never been meant to be implied that patient autonomy always supersedes justice, for example. But it also is never meant to be that they all apply equally to one individual. So the clinician is not supposed to be thinking about justice equally as to patient autonomy at the same moment. Right? So actually, when you're caring for a patient in front of you, you do have to respect their wishes if they're capable, for example, way before you have to consider is that an appropriate use of resource. It bothers all of us when we see inappropriate use of resource, but we know that patients have the legal right to make very poor decisions. So what if I had, um, get back to you, Patrick. So, so the challenge with that is that uh, we go back to the, the overarching donation ethical principle, the dead donor rule. So yes, this slide does indicate that if you're, if you're dead, the patient's interests are relegated down to uh, kind of the third spot there. But this patient we've described isn't yet dead, at least according to current criteria. Not yet. Patient's not declared yet. Um, so is this a consent issue? I know... Uh, Claudio Martin has signed his donor card. He understands So that's a good question, to which I don't have an answer. I think I would be much more comfortable uh, if patients yeah, understood patients, patients who could go and register, if they understood, they understood that this was, was a possibility, or in fact, this might even be the de facto process for a period of time. I would be much more comfortable with it. But even then, if a patient absolutely understands that, uh, you may still, as a professional, say, I still have a conflict about should I be doing something to a patient that is not for their benefit? In the same way that, that uh, you know, just because a patient says, I want you to help me die, many professionals are saying, whoa, whoa, that's beyond my professional obligation to assist you in your suicide. So, so patients' interests and professional obligations are two different things. Uh, that answer, me too, Sen had a question online, and I think he just answered it, whether this could be consistent with the patient's prior express wishes. 
do is professionally pay for a clinician to, 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 do, to go through with that, to do something. I mean, think about it. You're, doing, you're treating a patient, you have a, your oath is to that patient, and you're doing something to them, not for them. And in any other circumstance, I think we would say that's hugely problematic. But is it okay if they give consent? That's a good question. Another question I have here, is it different if the patient is already ventilated? So, Ravi, to your scenario, if, if the patient's already ventilated and it's just a matter of, well, we're going to continue to ventilate them for a, a, you know, another day or two, however long it takes to get things set up, does that make a difference relative to the scenario where we actually have to go, go forward with that? But, but oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I mean, but... <laughs> You can go on, and, and, and you'll see in, in a case uh, in the future uh, that we're going to present in a second, you know, where does it end? How, so we can intubate. What if it requires another procedure? Right? So you can imagine scenarios where we're going to continue to do things to a person that aren't for their benefit, and we can say, well, is that really what our professional values uh, require us to do? I think one of the difficulties with discussing ethical issues is that you can get stuck in one case and not get anywhere else. So I think we're going to move on. Uh, this is a three-year-old with flu-like symptoms. Um, <laughs> graduate. <laughs> let's, let's put that back on. Gradual decrease, loss of consciousness, taken to the emergency room, intubated. Uh, CT scan showed a brain mass, airlifted to our hospital. They arrived in ICU unresponsive, no brainstem reflexes, CT angio, no blood flow. Uh, so this patient uh, fulfilled the criteria for neurological determination of death. Family consented for organ donation. We needed a biopsy of brain mass to determine if a suitable donor. There's some um, uh, brain uh, uh, cancers that patients can go on to be a suitable donor. Uh, neurosurgery refused to perform the biopsy. Um, I'm not going to give them a comment. They really don't want to operate on a dead person and the withdrawal of life support proceeded with no organ donation. The family was devastated. Who wants to take this one on? <laughs> we have a dead person now, okay? Whereas before we did not, we now have a declared dead person. We needed a biopsy of the brain to, to determine whether or not um, this patient would be a suitable donor. If the patient's dead, it's totally appropriate to do the biopsy. We do all sorts of things on dead patients to assess their suitability for organ donation. And why not look for a surgeon who would be willing to do that? <laughs> Barb? It was on a weekend. Um, unfortunately, there was no second neurosurgeon available. The uh, pediatric neurosurgeon was not available. She was gone. So it became a legal ethical. We had the intensivists in PCCU calling people. We had actually Mike that we called as chair of the donor management committee meeting. It, um, it was huge. It wasn't just, okay, fine, we'll just close this case. We worked on it for hours trying to find somebody who would do the biopsy, and it, we, we hit a wall. I just ask, what are the points of process around doing procedures on patients that are already deceased? So what, is it, what are the guidelines for like CPSO, CMPA, the colleges, that kind of thing? What's going on? So outside the context of donation, uh, there is no framework to my knowledge, right? So it's, it's only within the context of donation. And within the context of donation, there's nothing that, I mean, as it's already been said, we do a whole host of things to bodies. If, if there were a policy that directed us, we wouldn't be asking the question. But we're doing no harm. <laughs> <laughs> but we're doing no harm. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, it... it in theory, you think back to that the the slide where we talked about the the kind of the rank of our uh, obligations, and for the deceased patient, the patient's interests do come below society's interests, and so you know I I think we raised this case because it actually happened. So it would be nice to have discussion about okay, well let's play devil's advocate. I mean, what happens when we're really struggling with this? Can this patient be transferred to another center? <laughs> 
that is willing to do biopsy. That would mean transferring a patient to another city. And in this case, family were devastated as it was. This was within a 12-hour period. This child went to the hospital, progressed to brain death, got transferred to London, consented to donation, and then we couldn't proceed with donation because of logistics. So that would have added a whole other element. And the family did end up putting, because we were still in the process of trying to resolve the biopsy when the family said, we're done, if you can't resolve this in this time frame. Yes to that question, should family consent? We don't transfer without family's permission. But, but back to our ethical principles, we can only do good here. I mean, I can't see us doing harm unless you can sort of tell me where the harm is going to be, and we can do societal justice. So, I mean, as a, as a collective here, we should be doing everything possible to ensure that these organs are retrieved. So, preaching to the choir. I, I, I think the hope was in this case that we would hear from some people who might personally have some difficulties with this so we could better understand that side of the argument. Why do we need a neurosurgeon? Should have called, should have called Neil. He would have done it. <laughs> but, uh, serious. Why do we need a neurosurgeon? There's no blood flow to this brain. The neurosurgeon has the right to, 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 to refuse uh, to do that. And I remember a case uh, some years ago of, a, of a, a child, a young man, coming in with hypothermia. He attempted and uh, been struck with fibrillation. They worked him for hours trying to raise the temperature. He had no brain blood flow, but they couldn't declare, declare brain death because of the low temperature. I was asked to put this patient on cardiopulmonary bypass to warm him up to declare death which seemed to me e extremely stupid, and I refused. <laughs> but uh, the same situation is here. And so the surgeon should have the right to, to refuse to offer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd say I disagree with his right to refuse, because we could have a cardiologist refusing to do angios to assess cardiac uh, suitability or uh, the intensivist refusing to do bronchoscopy to assess the pulmonary status. Uh, I would say that assessing a dead person for purpose of organ donation is now within the standard of care. Right? We do that all the time. That's accepted practice. So this is an unusual circumstance because we rarely have to get a neurosurgeon involved, but I would say assessing suitability for organ donation is within the standard of care, and he does not have the right to refuse. There was recently a case of a person with end-stage lung disease, uh, could not be weaned from the ventilator, otherwise healthy, wide awake, um, and the decision was to withdraw therapy. He did not want to live on a ventilator, and they asked him about um, DCD donation. Withdraw life support, let him die, and if he died in an appropriate time frame, he would be a suitable donor. He says, no, take me to the OR, take out my right lobe of my liver and both my kidneys, bring me back and withdraw withdrawal support. Family supported it. The patient signed consent. They couldn't find a surgeon to remove the organs. It's a recent case. One of the other concepts we haven't talked about is just how long should you keep someone on life support to do that evaluation? Because just because in this case they couldn't do it that day, I guess the family didn't consent to having it any longer, but should we be keeping someone on life support for three days to con complete the investigation? Uh, you raise an important point. Um, under most circumstances, we have somebody with a devastating injury to the brain. We often wait for progression of neurological determination of death. Failing that, we then proceed to donation after cardiac death. That's more a logistical problem and takes even more time. So anyone who comes to DCD, they're on a ventilator much longer than someone who's an NDD, for instance. So that's something we currently practice. Mike, pragmatically alone, you say, why couldn't we find another surgeon? Uh, well, unfortunately, we're credentialed to perform only certain specified procedures here. But uh, I myself have done burr holes 30 years ago. 
Um, it raises another potentially ethical issue that there, I, I think actually there should be a second call all the time, someone available within an hour or two for a surgical call schedule. For scenarios such as someone up two nights in a row, in which it may be argued you yeah, have to operate on the third day, uh, was that you know, or uh, or scenarios such as this. Um, two points. One about what you're credentialed for, and, and that's tied, I think, to Claudio's comment about whether or not this is the standard of care. What you're credentialed for and the standard of care apply to living patients. Well, once somebody's dead, we don't talk about the standard. What is the standard of care for treating a dead person? It doesn't make any sense. Ryder like, <laughs> <laughs> Rose would, would come right away and say, you can't do this. Uh, Any more questions? We already, if we, if we declare somebody dead in the ICU and we're aiming to retrieve their organs, we have process in place to ensure the integrity of those organs until they are retrieved, so that we do have a standard of care in place. So I think the question is just, is, is that process or is that standard of care? Because if your care, if it's standard of care, it's about caring for someone, obviously for their interest. So it's so, so the, the whole notion of what, what is the standard of care and what does it mean and how does it apply is actually really relevant right now and that Supreme Court case brought up a whole in, bunch of interesting points about it. So hopefully we'll be having more discussion about what is the standard of care and what does it obligate you to do. I don't uh, really understand why this really wouldn't be like an autopsy because if this patient has already been declared dead, right, why, why would it be different? Maybe we should have called a pathologist. In this particular case, I think where it became a struggle is, is that we didn't have an option B of calling somebody in. So respecting the one physician's wishes not to do the biopsy, but allowing a physician B to come in and do it. And that's where things got really Money. One last question. Just to mention the big ethical elephant in this room here, which no one's asked as to why this guy wouldn't actually do the biopsy. Was it laziness? Was it he didn't want to cancel his golf game? Was it I'm not going to address that? <laughs> so the second thing is, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, as a pathologist, why not let me go and do the brain biopsy? Uh, that's a good point. We never thought about that. The neurosurgeon's not here. Uh, he just there was just angst in terms of operating on a dead person. That was his point, and you have to respect that. I think we're going to go on to the next case. This is a 23-year-old motor vehicle accident victim. Came in at early morning. Um, call came in to show him at 5:30 a.m. The patient was extremely unstable, and therefore unable to perform a neurological determination of death examination. Uh, he looked brain dead, but we could not do that because he was in shock, and that's one of the contraindications. Patient was a registered donor, and family wished to fulfill the patient's wishes to become a donor. Verbal consent was obtained for laparotomy, for decompression of abdominal compartment syndrome. He had quite a bit of blood loss in his abdomen. Surgery was performed in the ICU as a patient too unstable to transfer to the OR. Patient was stabilized, and declaration of death was performed due to neurological criteria. Subsequent kidneys, liver, pancreas were transplanted. Requesting physician felt he, I should say, he or she had gone against his oath of do no harm, but the surgeon was comfortable with the procedure in this situation. The fellow was the one that actually went to speak to family about the laparotomy and then the intensivist was the one who performed the laparotomy. So the, the intensivist, the surgeon, was quite comfortable with the, cir the circumstances surrounding why he was doing the laparotomy and what the end result was going to be. Um, the fellow struggled with the do no harm. That was a, was a request for the laparotomy against the best interest of the patient. At this point, was not the 
that a getting consent issue that if it's somebody not doing the procedure, like you've got somebody getting consent but not the person doing the procedure, so that it m made it easier if it was obviously the surgeon who was going to do the procedure was on board? No, the, the idea of that he felt uncomfortable discussing it with the family. The surgeon obviously got the consent. Um, but but, but you, I, are you saying is there an ethical question about is it okay for families to make those decisions no, versus no, if a no, patient himself? No, oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Consent is not the formal consent. What the fellow was struggling with is that were we doing a surgical procedure on a patient that may or may not have been within that patient's best interest. So he wasn't necessarily, he was just struggling with the concept of why were we doing this laparotomy. But the patient wasn't dead. The patient was alive. The patient was not dead. You're doing a decompressive abdominal, for abdominal compartment syndrome, which we do all the time in patients who are alive. So oh, there's a procedure with a knife instead of an endotracheal tube, so how is it different from non-therapeutic ventilation? You're doing it for the purpose of making the patient declarable and donor, right? Yeah, so it's an extension tube. Um, this is just an extension of that. So if you don't find not, you know, intubation to be that traumatic to uh, a, a still undead person, undead living person, undead sounds a little uh, bizarre. Um, so so how, how far do you go? I, I mean, what if, uh, you know, you, you do this, but then they're, you know, you stabilize and you still haven't taken organs, and then there's a different, there's bleeds or something somewhere else. Do you go, go back and, and try to address that issue? How far do you go to do things to a body that is still not yet dead, uh, that are not in that person, not in that person's interest? Yeah, I'm not saying there aren't issues related to this. I'm just saying I don't see a difference between this and non-therapeutic ventilation. Just for the purpose of organs. Where do you draw the line? Uh, if, you know, imagine we couldn't, we couldn't, uh, you know, we we couldn't harvest organs for four days for whatever reason. Um, is it okay to continually do things to this body for four days? You know, like I mean, I would imagine we would think in a Frankenstein scenario it would be entirely inappropriate to keep a dead patient or keep a, a patient in in this limbo state for six months, before, you know, if we were waiting for, let's, let's imagine it was an infant, we needed the organs to mature a little bit, right? So they could be of a healthy size. Well, I think everyone would say, whoa, whoa, you crossed the line. So, so where is the line? And that's what I think what we're trying to, to ask. Um, I was just wondering, so if, if you took organ donation off the table, in this situation, what would the goals of care have been anyways? Would they have just allowed him to pass away? They still couldn't determine him neurologically brain dead. Would they have gone on to just try to resuscitate him, and which in case he would have needed a laparotomy anyway? Yeah, I, I suspect like in the all likelihood, if donation was not an issue here, we would be withdrawing support and letting the patient die. the lap was for the purpose of stabilizing to declare for donation. So the whole intent from the family's start from the beginning was that lap was not to save their son. Well, the question does raise the, the potential for a conflict of interest with a family who, who says, you know, like maybe there's a patient who could live in a not wonderful state. Uh, you know, they, they see Adrian Owen do, doing these wonderful things and they think I could tolerate that. Uh, but the family says, no, no, he should be an organ donor. Uh, well, where are, you know, that's, that's almost a conflict of interest. So it, it raises an interesting question, but in this case, yeah, probably not. Um, let me take it back again. Um, so we, we do a number of procedures on uh, patients who have been neurologically determined to be dead, bronchoscopies, angiograms, and so on. This is all a process. This is just a process, or is it considered standard of care? So is non-therapeutic ventilation standard of care, or is it a process? Everyone does it. No answer. <laughs> uh, but that's why we're having that's why we're having this discussion. I should say the majority of people do it. Uh, last time, I mean, the debate about non-therapeutic ventilation, I don't think was ever really resolved. Like, how long would you keep somebody alive? 
in 2000 in the UK, it, the Exeter Protocol was actually declared illegal for a period of time until they changed the law. The, the Exeter Protocol was the, the non-therapeutic ventilation protocol uh, prior to DCD there. So that they, they actually determined that legally this is inappropriate because you're doing things to a person not for their interest. Now, if they change the law over time, and of course now they have less problem doing it, it's not outright illegal, but yeah, the question isn't settled. Uh, the question is, what is the difference between the process that is always done and standard of care? In terms of definitions, what are your, what's the difference? What is always done is very closely related to the standard of care. Uh, all I'm raising is, does the standard of care apply when we don't have a patient that we're caring for? Yeah, I, I, I mean, th this is all, this is the gray area, right? This is, there is not set standards carved in stone about defining what is appropriate uh, to a deceased body and, and how far you can go before it becomes crossing the line. So that, that's the whole purpose of this conversation, though. But if you have some sentiments, I don't have a question because I'm going to go back to our uh, yeah, I think this is a very this is a, this is a very important term because uh, I'm not sure if it's a it's a legal term or an ethical term or how we're using it. I mean, if you use it legally, it's what uh, In this Rasumi case, they said Stand. you can determine that it's not standard of care to continually and uh, indefinitely ventilate someone who's in a minimally conscious state, but then you still have to go to the, the extra step and get consent of the family to withdraw that. So <clears throat> we have some, I mean, that's why I say that decision last week, it helps us understand this concept of the standard of care a little bit, but it's, there is a, a legal context to it and there's a professional context to it. And I think the variability between centers is absolutely important. I've got a problem with the fact that it's for DCD that we have variability between hospitals that are 200 kilometers away. I think that's problematic. I can't hear you all. I thank you for the most of the time. Uh, thanks very much for attending. I think we'll occasionally have these uh, on a regular basis. I think it's a pretty good discussion. And I tell you again to remind you to go to the Chilo checklist for your host family, family I think it's extremely helpful. Um, and, and thanks, thanks again, again for attending. Thank you. Thank you.